So here we're going to do a dem demonstration with halogens. We're going to take some chlorine, which I have some chlorine that's, that's suspended in water. I have some bromine suspended in water and some iodine dissolved and suspended in water. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to put chlorine into the first two test tubes. I'm going to put bromine into the next two test tubes and iodine is going to go into the final uh, fifth and sixth test tubes. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a halide salt with each. So with chlorine I'm going to mix bromide, sodium bromide, and I'm also going to mix in the second test tube with iodide. In the third and fourth I'm going to mix the bromine with chloride, bromine with iodide. And the fifth and sixth I'm going to mix iodine with chloride and bromide. And what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention to whether or not it reacts. Okay, and so to kind of help us keep track of that, here are six test tubes. Uh, we're going to be doing this where we're going to have an aqueous layer and we're going to have a, a, a layer of hexane. Okay, so in the first two test tubes, we're going to put some chlorine and chlorine. Okay, in the next two test tubes, we're going to put some bromine. So kind of keep track of the colors here. The chlorine water is just clear and colorless. Bromine kind of has a hint of yellow when it's in water. And the iodine is kind of purplish. Maybe a hint of brown. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put hexane into each, and that's going to change some of the color schemes on this, just based on how it interacts with each. Okay, and of course I'm wearing gloves because hexane is carcinogenic. And so as we go through and we, and we swirl these around and mix them, the halogens are going to tend to, to, to interact better with the hexane. And so we're going to see some of these change a little bit in their appearance. Okay. So first of all, the chlorine is clear in both. The bromine is yellow on the bottom and kind of a, a faint orange on the top. Yellow on the bottom, faint orange on the top. And the iodine is kind of brown in the aqueous layer and on the top hexane layer is actually kind of purplish. And as we allow that to kind of partition more, we're going to see those colors a little better. So this is our starting point. This is chlorine in both layers. This is bromine in both layers. And this is iodine in both layers. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix halide salts in. And if it reacts, we're going to see a color change occur. Okay. So we're going to put bromide ions with chlorine gas in here. And when we do, we see a color change start. I'm actually going to beef that up a little bit, I think. Just to really get that color to pop. And so now you can see this is no longer completely clear. And while faint, what we're seeing there is we're seeing the formation of bromine. Okay. And in the second one, we're going to put some iodide. And likewise, it's no longer clear. We can now see a color change. And what's happening is I'm forming iodine and chloride. Okay, and so we can see there's a similarity now between this one and these ones because I've now formed iodine and that's what we're seeing. There's a similarity between this one and these ones, although it doesn't look like it's particularly strong. Let me see if I can add a little more and get that color to pop a little bit. Okay, so not great, but the color is different now than the clear. Now, in the bromine liquids, I'm going to add chloride to one. When I add the chloride to this, nothing's going to happen at all. It's going to stay the same color as what it was before, except for being slightly more dilute. Okay, so it's still just the bromine, but when I add the sodium iodide to it, 
our reaction is going to take place. And I can see that this is forming iodine and bromide ions. So I can see the purple color and the brown color that matches these over here. Now in the last two, I'm going to put in some chloride into this one. And nothing's going to change. I'm going to be sticking with my iodine color. And in the final one, I'm going to put some bromide. And for consistency, I'm going to ramp that up with my slightly more concentrated bromide solution. And still, no change. I'm still left with the iodine as the principal feature. So, what we can do with this is we can then go through and analyze why this works the way that it does. Um, but first, let's go ahead and try and get just a regular backdrop behind there so that we can see those colors nicely. So what we ended up with was we ended up with um, bromine, iodine, bromine, iodine, iodine, and iodine. So in four of those cases, I ended up with iodine as the product. I've never ended up with chlorine as a product. So chlorine is the most reactive of those halogens, iodine the least. In two of them, I ended up with bromine, and that's showing that, that kind of I've set up on my periodic table that chlorine is the most reactive, then bromine, and then iodine. So here's the breakdown of those six test tubes. In test tube one, I mix chlorine and bromide and I ended up with bromine and chloride. Now that's a subtle distinction here, but essentially what's happening is, is you're presenting a charged ion, a charged halide ion, with a free halogen, and either the, the free halogen is capable of removing that electron from the halide, and you have a reaction take place and things change, or it can't. And for each one that it can, the opposite can't. So if chlorine reacts with bromide, then bromine will not react with chloride in the reverse direction. So one of these reactions will happen, one won't. So if I do the reverse of this down here, nothing happens. Chlorine reacts with iodide, and iodine is not going to react with the chlorine. Those are going to stay as stable products. And so when I come down here and I have iodine with chloride, nothing happens. What we can do to analyze this is kind of twofold. First, and more simplistically, we can say, you know what? Chlorine reacts with everything. Chlorine reacts with bromide, chlorine reacts with iodide. Okay, so we have a reaction taking place, we have a reaction taking place. This is the most reactive element of those three. So in elemental form, chlorine is going to react. Bromine doesn't react with the, with the product of the most reactive, but it does react with the iodide. So this reacts with one thing and not the other, and so that's in our intermediate stage. And then iodine doesn't react with anything, so iodine is the least reactive of the three. So as we move down the halogen column, the things are becoming less and less reactive. Fluorine would react with any of the halide salts. Okay? What we can then do is we can go through and we can look at this and we can say, okay, well, why is chlorine so reactive? Why is fluorine so reactive? Okay? And that involves us looking at things like from trends. So we're looking at effective nuclear charge, number of protons, amount of shielding. We're looking at principal quantum number. Uh, and that's about it. So, so the idea is, and we're going to simplify this down, we're only going to look at a single atom. Okay? But if I have a chlorine atom, and I have an iodide ion, how can I tell whether these will react or not? Or if they do react, how can I explain the way that they react? Okay, this will actually go a little better, I think, if we draw the Bohr models here. So chlorine has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. So on the very outermost electrons, on the third energy level, I have seven of them, and I have 17 protons, I believe. Okay? In between these 17 protons and these seven electrons are 10 electrons, shielding. And so for my electrons here, if I do my very simple base calculation of protons minus shielding electrons, I end up with effective nuclear charge of plus seven. If I go to bromine, bromine is going to have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. So for bromine, I similarly have my seven valence electrons. For this one, I have 
35 protons. So I have more charge pulling in, but I also have more electrons that are repelling those electrons away. Okay? So I would have 28 electrons here in those first three energy levels for an effective nuclear charge of plus 7. Now those effective nuclear charges mean that the pull on these electrons would be pretty equivalent if I eliminated all of the core electrons and 10 of the protons. Or all of the core electrons and 28 of the protons. Then I would have a similar net pull at that point. This accounts for the shielding and the protons combined. So I have similar abilities of pull on both of those cases. But what I find out is that these two things are not equal. The chlorine versus bromine, that if I have an electron to share between them, and I'm going to have a winner or loser, who's going to be able to get that electron? Chlorine is able to exert a stronger force than bromine is. Why? What's the big difference? If the effect of nuclear charge is the same, then in our Coulomb's law calculations or, or modeling, the fact that these protons are closer to that electron and there's a smaller distance means that I'm going to have a greater force in this nucleus on that electron. And therefore, that's going to pull the electron towards the, towards the chlorine atom more strongly than the bromine atom would be able to retain it. And so that free electron then, or not free electron, but that bound electron will transfer from the bromide over to the chlorine to become chloride. And so the fact that chlorine is smaller than bromine, given the similarities in effective nuclear charge, means that chlorine will be more reactive. Fluorine is only 1s2, 2s2, 2f, 2p5, and so for that it's going to be even smaller yet, and so therefore that's going to be able to pull on the electron even more, and that's going to make fluorine even more reactive. We are simplifying this down, of course, looking at a single atom. It would be a little more complicated if we made it diatomic, but the idea would still hold in that case. If we look at iodide, or iodine, it would be an extra energy level with the same effect of nuclear charge, and so it would have an even weaker hold on electrons, an even weaker pull on electrons, and so iodine is the least reactive of those halogens. Now, the end point of this is very crucial. All of those are reactive. You don't want to get fluorine gas on your skin that's going to eat right through it. You don't want to get chlorine gas in your lungs that's going to eat right through them. You don't want to get bromine liquid on you that's going to eat through it. So all of these are reactive. All of these are capable of pulling very strongly on electrons due to their effective nuclear charge, and the capacity for another electron. The opposite of these are, of course, the alkali metals, which are very good at getting rid of an electron. They have a very weak pull on their electron, and they're not able to kind of hold it. If you put chlorine with sodium, then they react very, very well, because the sodium is very loose with its electron, and chlorine is very aggressive at taking that electron. So that combination leads to a highly exothermic reaction to produce sodium chloride.